Welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm John Dickerson. The president's plans for health care reform have slipped off the rails, and as Congress returns from the August recess, the White House is trying to take control of the debate. Yesterday, Obama's aides announced that as a new part of that effort, the president will address a joint session of Congress next Wednesday. He will get more specific, they promise, and take a more active leadership role. I'm joined by Mark Amender of CBS News and The Atlantic, who first reported on this new phase of the president's strategy. Welcome, Mark. John? So what are they trying to do at the White House? Well, uh, essentially, this amounts to another attempt at uh, clearing the decks on health care, although the president has cleared the decks so many times at this point, uh, the, the wood is, is beginning to chip. Um, look, throughout August, the president's approval rating has dropped. The, the confidence the American people have in the president to fix the health care system has dropped. So the president has to, has to do what the president can do, which is use the bully pulpit to try and bully Congress, essentially, into getting him a deal. The White House wants to lower expectations, I suppose, in some way, but it's impossible. He's got to deliver totally. something. What, what, is he, what not is he going to undo by having this big primetime speech? Well, uh, it, it, it's a good question because there are several different knots, and, and it's unclear without the specifics that we, we assume the president's going to provide how he's going to try and untie the knot. The big question is, is one of the big questions is cost. Uh, if you are going to provide uh, uh, insurance coverage for the, uh, for the uh, uninsured, you have to spend money doing so. But if you spend money doing so, it can cost a lot unless the minimum benefit package is somehow reduced. So he has to figure out some way to reduce that, to, to untie that knot. He has to untie this knot about competition in the insurance industry without a public option, which doesn't seem to have the votes in the Senate. So how else is he going to put pressure on the insurance industry a lot, a lot of those are very specific questions. And then there's the public. Um, right. The, where, what lessons do you think the White House has learned or should they have learned about the environment in which the president is trying to sell this enormous reform? Well, the pre-decisional period, which is the period in some ways before uh, the mass of the public wakes up to whatever issue is being debated, is very, very important. By the time people began to concentrate on, on this major issue of health insurance, in some ways the debate had already been so polarized, in part because uh, the, the left had glommed on to this idea of a public option, which they see as sort of a fallback from a single payer system in which the government would pay every, everything. They think that, uh, that a, a public option essentially would lead to a single payer system. Eventually, Republicans predictably uh, fought back against that notion. And by the time the president engaged, everyone was fighting about that one small part of health care reform, but it had become so polarized that the entire issue had become polarized, the White House simply engaged too late. And they also seem to have missed uh, what's been in the polls, even before we had this crazy August in which people uh, yelled at town halls and there was all of this sort of carnival atmosphere. They also seem to have missed the idea that while people want the system to change, they're also fearful of the change. Do you get the sense that they're, they're going to address that idea that people uh, want to be comforted a little bit and, and know that there might be some guarantees that when everything changes, they're not going to be left in the lurch? Well, that's something that the White House was absolutely slow to recognize. You remember at the beginning of this debate, the words that the president used most often to describe the goal of health care reform was, was cost containment because there was some fear uh, that the public was very concerned about budget deficits. But it turns out, you know, the public sees this promise to provide uh, a new benefit for 47 million people, uh, all, all of this talk of a government plan, and they're very anxious. A lot of people, even if they're uncomfortable with insurance companies, they like their own insurance. It's one reason why over the past couple of weeks the president has tried to emphasize the consumer protections inherent in the bill. Uh, so far, though, public opinion has been very has been very sticky because, quite frankly, not enough Americans at this point trust uh, the president's thinking and direction on this, which is why a throat clearing, a clearing of the decks, a joint session to Congress with all the sort of, you know, the, the majesty and the pomp of a, uh, that a presidential address can bring, it, it might be in the White House's mind the only way really to focus the public's mind. So the White House, uh, one of the things that hurt them in the July, June period was that the, the president tried to talk, but he was competing with the congressional day-to-day -day going on, goings on. Okay, he's going to give this big, dramatic speech, but there's also still a little bit in the, the congressional story to go. We have the Finance Committee grinding right. on for more weeks. Uh, what's their feeling about the Finance Committee and its work? Is that basically all useless now? Um, or is the president, how, how are they going to you know, sort of deal with that? Well, th think of it as a question of bandwidth. The more people focus attention to the sausage making, which is still important because the Finance Committee 
uh, is going to play a significant role in figuring how to pay for health care reform. If the, you know, if, if the Congress decides to use this process known as budget reconciliation, you have a whole other committee. The Budget Committee is going to essentially have to rewrite an entirely new bill. So the White House's goal is kind of to distract people from all that and focus people on a couple of core concepts in a sense. Don't look at all this mess from Congress. Pay attention to the president. Pay attention to the president's promises uh, and, uh, and the president's priorities here. Uh, and, and we'll see if it works, because until now, people have paid attention to the sausage making in Congress. It hasn't been pretty, and no wonder there's a lot of anxiety. So that's the outside game. The inside game, though, it still seems the White House has to play, yep. based on my reporting, though, is trying to figure out either whether Chuck Grassley, who's played this Republican right. from Iowa, who's played, whether he's still in the game, or whether it's really now all about Olympia Snow, who's part of that gang of six in the Finance Committee, and her fellow Maine Senator, uh, uh, Susan Collins as the two Republicans they can get to still have some little whiff of bipartisanship. How are they doing on that inside game? Well, um, one of the things you saw yesterday was a, a very deliberate float uh, of a trial balloon from the White House that maybe the president would be willing to uh, accept uh, a, a, uh, a trigger uh, that would, would go into effect after a couple years if the insurance industry itself isn't able to produce the reforms necessary. This would trigger some sort of a, a public option or, or, or trigger some penalties on the insurance companies. This is something that Senator Snow has been talking about for a while. She and the White House Chief of Staff, Rahm Emanuel, have kind of been plotting behind the scenes to try and popularize this idea. Uh, and so in, in many ways, what you saw yesterday was, was sort of a public gesture to, to Senator Snow. The only thing I would say to that, though, is a lot of opinions, even in the Senate, have hardened about all of these core issues. And it's hard to see minds being changed uh, among senators who have been dealing with this not only throughout this debate, but for, you know, for five years, 10 years, as various health care reform attempts and in incremental parts or in large parts have gone through Congress. It's a really, it's a really you know, tough dilemma for them, which is, again, another reason why they're wielding this cudgel of budget reconciliation, again, using the budget process, which requires only 50 votes to push through uh, a package. And that will be its own tricky and ugly inside game. Absolutely. Uh, thanks so much, Mark, for joining us. My pleasure. I'm joined now by docu documentary filmmaker Joe Berlinger, whose latest film, Crude, highly praised at the Sundance Film Festival, focuses on the legal battle between the indigenous people from the Ecuadorian Amazon and the Chevron Oil Corporation. Hello, Joe. I want to, can you just set the table about this extraordinary story that you've told? What exactly is happening here? Yeah, I mean, it's a very complicated case. Uh, uh, basically, Texaco drilled for oil for three decades from 19, the late uh, 60s until the early 90s. And the plaintiffs allege that during this period, they dumped uh, 18 billion gallons of toxic waste directly into the rivers and streams that feed the area. Um, it, the lawsuit has finally uh, gone into the evidentiary phase about three years ago, which is when I started my film. Uh, originally, it was filed in, uh, in the United States in 93, shortly after Texaco left. Um, but then uh, Texaco, which then merged with Chevron, fought to send it to Ecuador, and it took about nine years for that trial to get started. Um, and, uh, and, and we're expecting now a, a judgment in that case in the, in, in the late fall. And tell us a little bit, the, the area we're talking about here is some of the most, or was, some of the most pristine in the world. I mean, this is, the, you know, the Ecuadorian Amazon is where the Amazon River uh, begins. Um, and uh, it, it, it is one of the most biodiverse places on Earth. Uh, and that's because it's one, of, it's one of the few places on Earth that survived the last ice age. Um, and it's, it, it's barely surviving the last 40 years of uh, oil development. Uh, there's hundreds of these unlined pits that were left that continue to leach into the water supply. Um, the, the air, the, the soil is saturated with, with oil. It's, 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 I was shocked when I went down there. I, you know, it was 10 times worse than what had been explained to me. Uh, people, pe people are dying of cancer. Uh, there is literally no fresh drinking water in an area that's the size of Rhode Island, uh, uh, 1,700 mile, 1,700 miles uh, square mile area. Were you shocked that uh, at the state of the devastation, or that devastation so grim could be sort of kept secret or not be on the front pages every day? Well, all of that. You know, I went. I kind of went down kicking and screaming. I wasn't sure I could make a film about such a complicated case, and uh, the plaintiffs' attorneys just felt like if I saw the pollution. 
that um, you know I would I would definitely want to make a film about it. And when and when I when I got down there, I just could not believe the level of of devastation and the fact that no one was talking about it. Um, even even if it's legal, even if somehow uh, Chevron has wrapped itself up in enough legal arguments to protect itself. Um, the moral responsibility of going into an area where people have lived in harmony with nature uh, and, and completely despoil that environment to take away the traditional means that people have of sustaining themselves. I mean, that's the thing that was so heartbreaking. You walk into these um, indigenous villages and there's just utter hopelessness and despair because there's no fresh drinking water, uh, the, the fish are dead. Um, you know, we force these indigenous people into this quasi-Western lifestyle by virtue of the fact that we take away their traditional means of sustenance, um, and yet, um, you know, we don't give them the economic resources to live that Western lifestyle. Have, have people who haven't uh, taken the trip you have uh, started to share your sense of shock? Tell me about the public reaction to this. And, and whether you have uh, hope that this will get beyond uh, the group of people that now know about that it's going on. Uh, you know, a, a every journalist that has gone down there has been utterly shocked at, at what, what is down there. Um, you know, it's, it's such a large area that's been completely um, ravaged. And what, what, you know, in this country you turn on the tap water and you have water. What people don't seem to get until you get down there is that these people live off of the rivers and streams that are down there and they've lived in harmony with nature for millennia and there is zero fresh drinking water down there. The water has been completely poisoned. Um, we saw babies with horrible skin rashes, uh, childhood leukemia, I mean the cancer death rate is, is three or four times higher than in the rest of the country. Um, it's 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 shocking. So even if there's you know this lawsuit has been going on for 17 years and it'll probably go on for another 10 years. One of the themes of, of the film is kind of the inadequacy of the legal structures that we have uh, to really solve these humanitarian and human rights uh, crises. I mean, by the time this thing gets solved, another generation of people will die. The, le uh, it, the legal battle sounds like uh, something out of Bleak House. Is there any way to speed it up, or is there any, uh, any hope for shortening that 10-year window? Well, you know, the, the, the lawyers in the case hate when I talk about how long this thing is going to take, and that, to me, is one of the themes of the film. Um, I mean, the, I think, you know, a profit-driven company like Chevron, uh, I think the only thing they really listen to is the court of public opinion. So if enough people get outraged and if it becomes embarrassing enough for them, maybe they'll settle. Um, but they have, they have sworn uh, to the plaintiffs and to the press that uh, they will, you know, that they will fight this thing forever, that they've promised the plaintiffs a, a lifetime of litigation. And that, to me, is tragic. You know, even in the Exxon Valdez incident, where there was no, uh, you know, no contesting who was responsible for that, uh, for that damage, uh, it took 20 years for them to finally pay off the punitive phase of that assessment. And at the 12th hour, they got a judge to reduce it by 80 percent. So, you know, one of the problems is when you have these massive environmental and human rights situations, it just takes too long to, to work it through the legal system. Quickly, as because, pe because people die and have been dying. As quickly as a last question, Joe, I wanted to ask you about the filmmaking, and this seemed like an incredibly intense process. Yeah. Can you talk just a little bit about yeah. making it and the, and the art uh, of making a documentary in a very far away place? Yeah, I mean, this was, uh, this was a very, very hard film to make. I mean, first of all, we were down at the equator, so that, you know, you got this 120 degree heat, uh, it's a malaria zone, so we had to cover ourselves up with protective clothing and lather ourselves up with industrial strength DEET. Um, it was a few miles from the Colombian border where the FARC was very active. So we had a lot on our minds as we were shooting this film, but we just felt there was, you know, this was a story that was not getting told and we really had to, we had to, you know, get it out there. Um, it was probably the hardest thing I've ever been involved in, but really very life-changing for me because, you know, I think somewhere we all know that the treatment of indigenous people around the world has been terrible, but it just, it, it really hit home. You know, you just don't go into somebody's backyard and dump toxic waste for 30 years. All right, Joe Berlinger, thanks very much for talking to us. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Finally, Restaurant Week in Washington has many in the capital checking out new places. Has the offer of a good deal helped the restaurant industry in Washington? CBS's resident foodie, White House correspondent Bill Plant, fills us in. At Washington Unplugged, we spare no expense, well, almost none, to keep you up to date. So today, we're taking on a really difficult assignment. We're going to talk about Restaurant Week, okay? We're at Zola Restaurant in Washington, D.C. with food writer 
Nikki Nellis, who has a website called thelistareyouonit.com, and Dan Meshes, who is the owner of Zola. Restaurant Week, why? Restaurant Week started several years ago um, as a way to bring people in. Um, it was originally started actually after 9-11 up in New York City and it was a way to get people to cut back into the restaurants. They offer special prices at both lunch and dinner and uh, DC has taken it up and we've been doing it for years and people really respond to it. I've heard some criticism of the price increase. Uh, some people say, okay, um, it isn't restaurant week because, you know, they're jamming me. <laughs> well. Let's hope that's not, not the way it is. And I think most uh, restaurateurs uh, approach this as this is a great opportunity. Let's open up our whole menu. That's what we do here at Zola and at Potenza. And just go ahead and go for it. There's probably a couple of restaurateurs out there that offer a, a limited menu, and people might not be happy about that. But overall, most people are with the spirit of it. There's two things happening. One, you're going into a restaurant and you're getting a real opportunity to see what they can do for a lot cheaper than normal. And that's important. But it's not a wash for the restaurant. They're not doing you a favor. I mean, it is a business. So I think people have to keep that in mind when they go in. You should have great food. You should have great service. But you can't expect you can't expect a hundred dollar meal for thirty five dollars. We look at that loss of revenue during that time. Really, it's just a marketing cost, and we hope that people will have such a great time they'll come back. And do you find uh, talking to people that they come to places that they normally might not go because of the expense? Absolutely. People think it's a real opportunity to go in and try that restaurant that they think may be out of their economic reach. And as Dan said, if they succeed, chances are people say, oh, I'm definitely going back there. Well, I know several people in our office who made lists of all the places they want to go during restaurant week. Yeah, people absolutely do. Uh, and uh, we see a, a jump in reservations, uh, online reservations, for sure this time. And we do them twice a year. We do it in January, which traditionally is a slow time in Washington, uh, with, when Congress is out, and then again in August when Congress is out. So I, am, I can tell you that I know that our business is up significantly during what would usually be a slow time in Washington. For the price, it's the absolute time to try it. And I think we see a lot of that. We do see a lot of first-timers come. And, and it's just what you said earlier. Take a chance. There's a lot of times people won't want to, whether it's the economy or whether it's just, I'm just not sure, that's a little esoteric. They give it a shot. Thank you very much, both of you, Nikki, Dan, for being with us on Washington Unplugged. Thank you. And now it's time for lunch. That's it for Washington Unplugged. Thanks for watching. We're here every day at CBSNews.com. I'm John Dickerson.